being here in the in the beautiful Venetian lounge and being on the ship. Um, it, <clears throat> this really is a beautiful place. We're going to many beautiful places uh, on the way, all the way back to the far, cold, cruel north. And my wife and Barbara, I just escaped the snowstorm and everything, so we're just going to have to suffer together for these couple of weeks while we are visiting all these fantastic places. Um, just by introduction, I'm a, a merchant marine officer with a U.S. Coast Guard license, and I worked in ship operations around the world. <clears throat> and so I come to Peru every year or two, and I have uh, spent quite a bit of time in Peru and then Ecuador and up to Panama. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you things that you, perhaps you'll never see or you'll never believe. <laughs> and so today I'm going to talk about this fantastic country of Peru, which has uh, been called the um, one of the cradles of civilization, along with Egypt and Mesopotamia and China, where an, an original human civilization was created in isolation from the other ones. And then, of course, there's been the cataclysmic uh, co uh, conflicts and combinations of these civilizations. So Peru, in particular, has been called the Egypt of the Americas, where the past haunts the future. So I'm going to show you just some of the topography and uh, some of the history and some of the sites that... Uh, did anybody get to Machu Picchu in this particular pre-canceled? Uh, well, that, that's why I brought, uh, I brought it to show you, including a big rock. You can touch it, say you were there. Um, but otherwise, there's so much to see in, in Peru. There's, there's over 100,000 uh, registered archaeological monuments. And so they just keep finding more and digging out more, even in downtown... Lima, there are a number of pyramids, the huacas they call them, which are left in sort of jammed in neighborhoods, but they have yet to excavate m many of the things just even in, in the vast city we were just in. But you know the, the topography, some of it's uh, the Pacific Ocean along the, the Great Trench, which is subsuming the continent of South Africa and raising the Andes, which are one of those mountain ranges which is still growing. Uh, but this means they have very deep seas and a lot of oceanic... Uh, life right off the shores here in Lima. You see La Paz is up in the mountains and then the various salt lakes going down into Chile. And this has been called the land with access to almost any kind of uh, weather, altitude, climate, and ecology within a short distance of so many hundred kilometers a mile. So you can go from the Amazon up to the mountain peaks and then you can go down to the beach and off to offshore islands and deep jungles versus almost Arctic conditions up in the very high parts of the Andes. And so this created a, a nation of uh, tremendous contrast, um, being that the people who live from the Amazon up to the Antiplano, it's called, Lake Titicaca, then down to the coast, they have, no, they have very difficult transportation and sometimes have no contact with each other uh, just because of the topography. Roads have been built across into the Amazon. There's a Trans-Amazon Highway, which is coming in to near the Rio um, uh, Ukiali, and that will transform upland um, Peru with the same sort of development pressure that has already cut across the Amazon and the Pantanal in South America. Um, so that's the current issue of it. But you know uh, that we are, of course, in Lima. Machu Picchu is, is about 41 kilometers from the ancient Incan capital of Cusco. Iquitos is the Atlantic port for Peru because ocean going ships of a certain up to about 20,000 tons can come up to the port of Iquitos and load on lumber and natural goods to send out via the Amazon to the rest of the world. Otherwise the major port of course is Lima as we've seen. Th this country was um, formed out of the uh, the Spanish Empire is an, an inheritor of some of the boundaries of the Incan Empire, and then it has been in struggle ever since with its northern, southern, western neighbors. The definition of the borders with Ecuador, Colombia, Brazil, and Chile have all been disputed in various wars. But they all, in this area, they all share this very dramatic coast, which in many of the offshore islands are covered with bird life. So one of the first big industries in colonial Peru was going to these island, rocky islands off, we'll see them on our passages, that were many feet thick for centuries of bird droppings, which were the great fertilizer of the previous era before chemical fertilizers, nitrate, was invented. <coughs> but though we saw the ship right off of the port here yesterday offloading fertilizer from Ukraine. 
anyway, this coast is very rugged. You have the mountains coming down to the sea. You have alluvial plains with uh, rivers that have washed out uh, great delta fans into the oceans, very rich marine life in all this whole area, in contrast to how barren the, the uh, land is. Now, the desert has been, in the south, has been, over the centuries, uh, proceeding north, and when you get to Ecuador, which we will in a few days, you'll notice that it's suddenly all green again. That's just because of the ocean currents and the al altitude and the uh, the latitude such that th this part of Peru has almost no forest cover on the coast. It does over in the Amazon coast. So this is one of the valleys that come into the Pacific north of Lima, and it has been the case for thousands of years. They have intensive agriculture in what is otherwise a a very arid place, and that's where the old ancient civilizations have been um, excavated that had been abandoned until recent discovery. A lot of this also has a lot of lush wildlife. Here's a group of flamingos, there's a lot of bird ways going down to Patagonia, then coming all the way up to North America. Uh, but the, the, the ocean is particularly mineralized and full of a coal current that comes up called the Humboldt current up to the Peruvian coast and it is a great feeding and spawning ground for many many fish. So going back in antiquity the main protein of the people was fish and then they would trade it with the highland people for other goods. So this meant that there was a kind of a robust food economy going back into ancient times. Uh, but when you start going up in the mountains, it looks rather forbidding. It's in, these mountains are among the steepest in the world in the sense of just the, the fast grade that they go up to. <coughs> the top one's Chimborazo at about 24,000 feet. And there's a whole string of these kind of peaks that run north-south in the Andes. But amazingly, that was also the home for the Quechua, Aymara, other group of Native Americans who adapted to that high altitude and thrived mainly because they had uh, uh, developed uh, agriculture that would grow there, most famously your favorite uh, vegetable, the potato. And so that before the Spanish came, this Antiplano highland of Peru and Bolivia actually had many more people then than it does now. But the... Um, the people are very colorful, they, they, they breed their llamas, <coughs> they had no cattle. But the llama was the beast of burden, though it, it's such a pesky animal, it refuses to be uh, saddled and ridden. So it was just a, like a donkey, it would carry goods up and down the mountains. And they would trade over these kind of passes all the way into the Amazon and had tropical uh, products coming up to the uh, to the highlands and then they go all the way down to the seacoast and bring back dried fish and things like this. So this made Peru a kind of an unusual economy. You had tropical maritime and highland communities that were in trade with each other, however difficult. And this is the symbol of the Andes in Peru, the great uh, uh, South American condor, which is the largest bird in the world, over three meter wingspan. And they have been in danger just by for random hunting and there are now a number of uh, preserves where they um, protect them and hatch them and they're out. You can see them again after many years of almost being extinct. But this is a very forbidding country and I, on my uh, first time in Peru I was uh, hitchhiking down from Panama down to Colombia, Ecuador, Peru and I went over from the seacoast town of uh, near Tru Trujillo where we'll be near over the mountains over into the Amazon and then down one of the tributaries called the Rio Marañón. And you nowadays go there, and unfortunately it's been mostly deforested. The devastation of the upland forests is particularly severe in, in Peru. But when you get then down into the flatlands, where there are no roads and no access, then you get this kind of meandering tropical rivers that then are tributaries for the, for the great Amazon. And again, Iquitos is the Peruvian port on the Amazon. And if you've ever gone there or just read about it, see films, it's you know, full of all kinds of creatures and life that we don't even know much about as it's, in the mean, meantime, much of it has been destroyed by mainly cattle ranching and agriculture. But it does have hundreds of indigenous groups, many of them isolated from each other, and many have been assimilated into what it's the general, the mestizo culture, the mixed Spanish-speaking, peoples who have lost their original language, but even in, in Peru and the upper Amazon in general, there are still uh, isolated people living in villages so far away from each other that they 
have never been had contact. And so Brazil and Peru and Colombia, they have uh, agencies to try to protect the last aboriginal, s literally Stone Age people that uh, when they're contacted, they usually either get a disease or else they get a bottle of rum and that sort of unravels their whole lifestyle. So that some of them are protected to this day. That's a helicopter came down to, to uh, drop them s food supplies. And of course they were greeted with bows and arrows and blowguns. Anyway, I traveled down that area. I stayed with the Hivoto people. On my way down the Amazon, I continued from the uplands of Peru all the way down to Iquitos and Leticia in the Colombian side. But that is a whole different world itself. The Amazon is this great carpet of uh, vast forests and settlements on the rivers of Belen. This is in Peru where they have floating houses. This is Iquitos, the main port, and a fairly large town in um, the the lower Amazon part of Peru, it is prone to this kind of flooding, so instead of having a pickup truck, it's better to have a canoe. But we are back on the coast. This is Callao, right where we are. We're, we're docked right off of one of the main container ports, you can see. Um, but this was a peninsula that protects a bay that was why it became a major port and a facility for the Spanish Viceroy of Peru. Uh, the name being an indigenous name, they said named after the servant girl of a viceroy of Spain. That then became the official name. But you are here today, Miraflores and City, the great cliff overlooking the ocean. Then back out in Callao, you have the great uh, fortress of San Felipe, which is one of the largest forts the Spanish ever built in the, in the Americas, and that was the stronghold to hold this west western coast of South America. Now it's a national monument, but it's still pretty impressive. Um, and never had been conquered by anybody other than the uh, political troubles of Peru as itself in the current period. Well, you were down in downtown uh, Lima. You have the grid, modern city. You have the old colonial city. Then it just is sort of vast, a, a sprawling megalopolis with about at least 10 million people. And many people come from the outside uh, provinces and even from over the mountains in the Amazon to come and get educated or find work and become a citizen of the, the new world which is represented by the city. And so it has these grand plazas, Plaza San Martin, and uh, commercial buildings, uh, cathedrals. I mean, maybe you went to see some of this, but the, you know, this is a Spanish traditional culture, colonial culture, which is very rich and, and certainly self-righteous. So all of the gold that they stole from all of the natives went into the gilding of the cathedrals and building of beautiful altars and such. Uh, and especially if you go to Seville, Spain, you can see the most glorious of them all. But in Lima at the uh, cathedral, you have the tomb of the inf infamous Pizarro, who was the Spanish conquistador, came down from Panama, and he conquered the Incan Empire by ruse and by brute force. And uh, I was reading, though, that uh, when they went to, to, uh, to check on the tomb, they, they opened it one day, found it was empty many years ago. And then they found in a, in a ciphered document that they, they took his remains, put it in a lead coffin in the basement of the crypt so that no counter-revolutionaries would come and desecrate his body. Well, he's still there. He's taking it easy after his desecration activities. Then you have all these other beautiful buildings, the Archbishop's Palace, the uh, Palazzo de Justicia, et cetera, and uh, sort of grandiose national architecture because Peru considered itself the wealthiest country in the world for quite a while because of its uh, gold, silver, uh, uh, guano fertilizer exports, copper, all these things are still mined to this day. It's, a, it's the, uh, along with Chile, it's one of the largest producers of copper in the world, which of course is ever valuable. Then you have all these beautiful plazas, this one is strewn with flowers on National Day, but it, uh, I was reading again that this was a, a traditional custom in the Incan Empire that up in the capital in Cusco on certain festival days, they would have hand carried up sand from the beaches on the Pacific hundreds of miles away to cover the plaza in, uh, in, in, as a beach and they would rake it out and then have a day on the beach just because they could. And it w maybe another day they'll get up to the mountain because capital of Cusco. But anyway, this is more Lima, the presidential palace. And you can see this guard is probably Quechua. He has a very uh, indigenous face to him and a Spanish-style suit. But the politics of Peru have been in constant upheaval, even going back to the Incan 
days where there was constant uh, battles between families and groups and then leaders who were uh, deposed and executed. And so the tradition has gone on in modern day Peru where they every so many years they have a coup d'etat or a military takeover or another insurrection. And so we're n right now we've gone through the last couple of decades, uh, Alejandro Fujimoro, who's Japanese Peruvian, replaced by Pedro Toledo, who was also in, in Quechuan as from the highlands. But the president you might have been reading the news about recently is Pedro Castillo, who was from um, Ayacucho area, which is a Quechua majority indigenous population of subsistence farmers. And he was a, a teacher. And then he represented the let's say the majority of uh, Peruvians and his his slogan is that w there should be no poor people in a rich country. So inequality is sort of driving the whole equation of Peruvian history from ancient times to the present where the uh, the city of Lima and other mining centers and ports are very prosperous but the further go you go inland the more people are, are living on a subsistence basis. And so under democracy, he was elected. Then he tried to dissolve Congress after they investigated for corruption. And then he was arrested himself. Sounds like some other countries have this problem. I can't think of anyone in particular. But anyway, they went into, uh, into protests. And particularly the people in Ayacucho and Cusco and, and the highland areas where the majority of people actually live um, protested. There was fighting with the police. There were some 20 that were killed last week. And then they, um, the Congress then chose the Vice President Dina Baluarte as the president. And just two days ago, they agreed to have a election next year. But this is sort of symbolic of the power of, uh, of Peru. First of all, the, the military and the national police are sort of the pawnbrokers of who's going to be president and Congress and all such. And so he, this Adina, they call her, the new president, is um, representing her people, but under the purvey of, let's say, the stability that the police and the military allow. So she comes from a village with this, where this is the, the dress and the subsistence uh, agriculture. The people up in the highlands are very colorful, particularly because they have such an extensive weaving tradition. But they're also very poor. Here's cattle being shipped down to the cities for... Uh, processing and meanwhile they're having such a severe drought up in the highlands here's a recent picture of of children collecting uh, sheep that had died of thirst out on the hillsides and so climate change is making all this much worse for all those people and that's one reason the the city uh, the country is still very destabilized by endemic poverty and they estimate that they've uh, Prices have gone up so much that they're going to plant one-third less crops this year because of the price of fertilizer because of the war in Ukraine. And so this comes down to the you know, funerals for, this was a teenager who was shot by the police last week. And so the country's once again in kind of an anguished moment, but because they're going to have elections next year, it should be hopefully uh, peaceful because Peru has already seen enough bloodshed over many things over the many years. But meanwhile, back in the cities, it's a very pleasant life. And here's the main university in Lima, San Marcos. And if you saw their plazas and prosperity here, particularly in Miraflores, which is a high-end shopping area, and that's where uh, maybe some of you stayed in a hotel. But uh, back up in the hills, you start to get kind of favelas like in, in, uh, in Brazil, where the poor live way out of town and way up the hill, where there are very little services. And uh, so that's just the way of life here, as it is in many parts of the world. But nonetheless, they have universal education. The uh, Catholic Church runs most of the schools in the name of the state. So it's a very religious country. And they have big fiestas, festivals, saint days, and they also have a mixed uh, ethnic uh, composition in Lima. Here's the Chinatown parade in Lima. And you, you mentioned uh, Fujimoto, who's Japanese, Peruvian president. But then like many uh, uh, big booming tropical city, uh, although this is in a desert, it has terrible traffic jams, can't keep up with the infrastructure, especially you get a traffic jam like this one. But uh, even the military has its patron saint, which is I believe called uh, hmm, Mercy, please. Anyway, that's uh, the Virg Virgin Mary, I believe. But they were confronted for a decade or two by the 
uh, terrorist warfare, the Shining Path, the uh, Sendero Luminoso, it's known in Spanish, which was again driven by poverty up in the extreme areas of the country. And Fujimoto, when he was president about 20 years ago, he declared martial law, and they battled them out to the point of su suppressing most of them. But the uh, the political parties that rep supported the current president, uh, past Castillo, very much tried to take that kind of anger and turn it into electoral p politics so it wouldn't be so violent. Well, here we are back in Lima. That's one of the pyramids that's right downtown, the Hualamarca one. Again, a, a ceremonial um, platform back in the pre-Incan days. A lot of the coastal uh, archaeological sites are not Incan. They go back another thousand years for other communities. But the Incans are famous because they did meld over the whole area and their leadership, uh, a, a divine rulers that were not allowed to even step foot or have any inconvenience life. They, they ruled various areas and then they fought amongst themselves, but they were unified um, <coughs> by one great leader, Incan Puchahil, who made the world's largest empire at the time. It stretched from near Panama all the way down to mid coast of Chile, meaning it was bigger than any other empire at, at the time. And then it had a great deal of wealth that came back to the capital in Cusco. So this is sort of a version of the Sun King. This is drawn by a European uh, illustrator back when there was still a royal court of the Incans under the Spanish after they had their first battles and were conquered. Uh, but this empire was remarkable because it had one of the largest road networks in the world, some 20,000 kilometers of paved road stretching out with runners to pass messages to all of the provinces and the peoples. And they used, a f they had no written language, they had no wheel, they had no metal, but they had this uh, rope with knots tied in it, which was a form of of communication. So if you could read what's called the Quipu in Quechua, then you could read it like a telegram. And it's only been in the last couple of decades that because of computer analysis, they were able to take some of these remains that are in some museums and then they were able to translate them. So that's sort of like the Rosetta Stone. Now they're being able to understand a bit more of the communication that the Incans used. Uh, but then came the conquistadores. So when the Spanish came in from Mexico, Peru, came down here looking for gold, and Pizarro was a, what they call a, a Hidalgo, a son of somebody, but he was a lesser leader and looking for fame and fortune. And he came and he captured Altahualta, the Incan king, who had come from the highlands to see these strange, the description that came into Spanish, the hairy people that ride on terrible beasts, being horses. There were no horses here before. Also, no dogs and cats, but uh, uh, they came down, uh, 6,000 of them received Pizarro in the town square of Cajamarca near the coast. And uh, when they were all assembled and made, exchanging greetings, Pizarro signaled his troops. They shot cannon and charged the Incan troops with horses and sliced their way through them and killed most of them and drove the rest of them away and captured Altahuata, where he was given a... Uh, execution after paying a ransom of a, a very large room full of gold. So the Spanish didn't even keep, keep their promise to let him go. And that meant that the other leaders of the Incan Empire, they either had to swear allegiance to the King Philip of Spain and the R Catholic Church or else they would be executed. They're considered subhuman, what was called the, the Holy Writ. They had to completely agree to be subjects or else they were savages and could be killed. And that was the way that the conquistadores sort of took over most of the the Americas. And then there was a Creole culture of the Spanish mixing in with some of the local no, uh, nobility and then the mestizo mixture came about. But a lot of it was under forced labor and hardship, setting up hacendado plantations for agriculture. And then a bunch of the Incans and other indigenous peoples would, rather than submit, they would go back into the eastern mountains. And here's a city called uh, Vilcabamba, which is up perched on a mountain near Machu Picchu. And so there was a resistance for about a hundred years against the Spanish, <coughs> led by this <coughs> Quechuan called Tupac Amaru. Curiously, that became the name of a rap singer, not related at all. <coughs> but th there, were, there were other civilizations. Be before the Inca, 
all along the coast. There were the Nazca, the Paracas, Moche, Chimu, Sican. And this is what has been excavated in recent decades and sort of made a revelation that, well, this was one of the most ancient places on Earth where there were human inhabitants. The oldest remains in a cave date to about 11,000 years ago, m meaning there's there was... Uh, people coming down all the way down the coast, including one site that's in Chile that has art of hunting tools that they dated back to 15,000 years ago. So there's been a long history here just like the rest of the world. But these sites, of which we'll go see on our excursion day after tomorrow, Chavin and the Chan Chan and other um, monumental cities with hundreds of acres of buildings. So there had been a very large population of these places that just disappeared probably because they dried out or they had warfare. But they keep finding more of these fantastic uh, graphic images and terracotta work. Most of the gold work and the mummy remains have been looted and sold off. But uh, the, these uh, remarkable structures are there for us to see. We'll, we'll be going this to the Temple of the Sun in Moche. And they keep finding more. As I said, there's some 100,000 registered sites, most of which have not been excavated properly. Here's another, Pachamaca, which is the kingdom, uh, the temple of the earth. And again, it sort of looks like a Babylonian or Minoan uh, scale um, construction, probably with slave labor. Uh, then they find in the tomb some tremendous gold works. Uh, Barbara went to the... Uh, the Laura Museum, um, if anybody in Lima today, that fantastic museum of all of the pre and most ancient of the artifacts, and they keep finding more. As the Lord of Sipan was the most fantastic in recent years, and so here's a panorama of what, what his uh, daily uh, workout uh, gear is. But there's a lot of this fantastic metalwork with gold, not forged, but pounded into foil. And they didn't consider gold good for anything but for decoration. So when Pizarro asked for a pile of gold, they said, well, we'll just give you what we got because we were making more. And it didn't, they'd never used it as money or anything of intrinsic value. Uh, but <coughs> nowadays, they keep finding in deeper tombs more of this. The other remarkable thing in Peru to the south of us are the Nazca lines, which are a mystery of who made them and especially why. And in that area of the, the desert, going to the Chilean border, there's a gravel over, overlay on the great stretch of the desert. But if you scrape down not too far, you can make a white line. And so that led to this sort of earthwork of earth art, if you want to call it, uh, that spread over hundreds of square miles. And this is the, the, the one that you can see from sea. It's called the Candelabra candlestick in Spanish and that is etched into the side of the cliff and you can see it from well offshore but if you're up close you can't really if you're hiking there you can hardly notice it of course this is very dramatic because it's up and you can see it from afar the ones that are just over the in inland though on the broader plains are spread out very far and you can see the the designs that they made this is just the the overview of them but this is what they are and in in a sense anybody who made that could not see what they're making you they were only discovered because when airplanes came to peru they were flying over there and said who, who drew those funny lines out in the desert and they now they found hundreds and now they're finding even more with using uh ground penetrating radar they're finding a whole bunch in other mountains so this was something that uh was done for a thousand years perhaps over two or three thousand years ago, they just don't know because there's no record, nobody living today has any memory of why this happened. And of course then it's become speculation, it must be aliens and God, charity of the gods uh, sort of uh, um, imagination about these creatures that uh, prove something, but uh, they're, they're just um, um, kind of unbelievable because when you're there, there, there's a highway going right through that one. But if you're there, you can't see it. It's just a trench over here and a trench over there. This is the famous monkey, which is about three miles wide. And uh, here's another one that we call the runway. So it would be hard for modern surveyors to get it quite so straight for so long, I think. And then there are other remarkable things in other parts of uh, uh, 
Peru. This is in the Ica Desert south of the Nazca area where they have oases such as in Sahara or the Gobi Desert. And there the ancient people dug these circular wells which remain and even in this extreme desert, the Atacama Desert is the driest desert in the world, they have water down and if they don't find it they dig even further. So that, again these wells are we don't know how old they are, 1,000, 2,000 years old, but they're still being used today. Again, out of the archaeology, they're bringing up all kinds of most curious things. Here's a chieftain in his Amazon bird headdress. And among the Incas and some of the other groups, they considered nobody ever died, especially the leader. And so, curiously, um, any ruler would keep all of their possessions long after death, and the family would bring them out and serve them a dinner once a year, put them back into the, into the uh, storage area. So they practiced mummification, most famous of which are the, the ones they found up, the, up in the, the children that are ritually sacrificed on the top of peaks and then dry out and are mummified for a thousand years or more. Another curiosity is that the children of, no, of the nobility would have their heads deformed with boards and straps so they would come with a face like that, sort of uh, a little scary. Well, a lot of this is at the at the Larco Museum. So you went there today, and this was the the heritage of the Herrera family that went and collected as much as they could before it was lost or looted or sold off. So th this museum in Lima has just a sampling of them, you know, the, the golden slippers and uh, fantastic Lapulazzi uh, uh, jewelry. Um, very delicate um, textiles that have remained because of the dryness of the climate. And these themselves have to be very carefully kept because they will deteriorate. But these are robes w woven a thousand years ago. It's as if you're opening up a Egyptian tomb and finding their clothing still intact. This is uh, made of all feathers, probably from the Amazon again, where the birds are so colorful. And a uh, a little ceremonial headdress. I maybe we'll wear that on formal night. Then there's mostly, though, in the museum, uh, all the vast variety of ceramics because that remained in, preserved in the tombs and underground. So these are the Nazca south of Lima, with a lot of uh, iconography painting on it. And when I was here, when I was backpacking around Peru, I was offered one of these by one of my young friends that I met said, yeah, it'll fit in your backpack and you take it. I said, I can't take one of these things. And later I found out it was a thousand year old vase that they sell for $100,000 in, in an antique dealer in Berlin maybe. But uh, they're, they keep finding more, so there's a, quite a supply. This one has a condor uh, uh, painting on it. So some of them are as elaborate as any other culture at the time in the world. Th uh, this one's unusual because it's called a whistling jug. And when you blow in the backside, it creates an eerie whistling sound. And they said this was a form of ceremonial music. They'd sort of uh, have a, a chorus of these. <whistles> and in the right temple, it sounded pretty mysterious, I suppose. So again, it's an unusual construction of ceramics that has an internal fipple and a, and a resonator and then it has somebody playing the panpipes uh, uh, and the sound comes out of his teeth. Here's another one that would have water to modulate the sound as you blow into the, uh, the, the right side of it. And so there's a great deal of uh, remarkable artifacts and creativity from all these different people in different parts of Peru going back for thousands of years. Uh, this is some kind of an ivory necklace and a copper mask. Again, copper being common here, iron is fairly rare. So they never had um, steel or iron works in, in, in the ancient times. So here's again from the Museum of Gold. The, uh, this is another one, the uh, Museo Mujica Gallo, which is just for the gold works. And I think those are the original bitcoins. I'm not sure. Something that looked like something. And then a funereal mask again, sort of like that mask of uh, ma uh, of uh, the king of Macedonia was like that—a gold foil put over the face of the deceased. So, if you're looking for a bargain, uh, you got to get a shovel and dig for more. I know there's some out there, but these museums are the pride of Peru because they show what a 
uh, remarkable culture they, they had, and then became a colony. Now, this is one of the uh, Spanish drawings of the capital of the Incan Empire, uh, Cusco, which remains as a modern city of about a half million people in the high valley. It's at about 11,000 feet, so when you go up there, you have to rest for a day or two just to acclimatize. It's, uh, uh, it's sort of like the Lhasa of, uh, of the Andes. But it's a modern city with uh, schools and a whole community. This is the Plaza de Armen, the cathedral. That had been um, built in the early colonial times. The, uh, then the Incan army came back and bombarded the city with what they call flaming rocks. They would wrap boulders with... Uh, uh, cloth that they would soak in a resinous pitch and then set them on fire and they had big slings and so they did siege warfare, drove the Spanish out of the town, they came back, they built the cathedral. So unfortunately there's been a lot of fighting in this whole area over the years and some of the original Incan palaces and temples, the foundations are so solid they just put a colonial Spanish building on the top. I did stay there for a couple of months on a little lane like this with llamas coming down from the hills to the market and then I went on to hike to Machu Picchu. But this town is the ultimate contrast of European Catholic synergy with the other indigenous customs. So like a lot of Latin America, they, they would have a uh, the Christianity, but it would also be mixed with a lot of the uh, local lore and or double naming of the, the personage to match the other mythology. But around Cusco, there's some remarkable stonework. These are the famous um, Sasquatchman uh, palisades, which are built with these fine cut giant uh, blocks of granite from the nearby mountains that fit together such that you can't put a piece of paper between them. So this was noted by the Spanish, this advanced masonry, but they could never find out this, the secret of the uh, stone, this famous 12-sided stone that was somehow set right in and again everything fits perfectly tight. So this been, again speculation, how could they possibly do that? They had no metal. It was all stone against stone chipping supposedly. And then one researcher said he found traces of certain mineral caustic that he thought that they would actually coat the stones and that would dissolve the immediate layer and then they would settle in completely tight. But again, they don't know what it is, and they've never been able to recreate it. But meanwhile, Cusco, in particular in the upper highlands, they've had this resurgence of indigenous pride and um, recreating of ceremonies of uh, their previous uh, various gods and sun worship and astronomical ob observatories. So, and they've also made uh, dramatic movies recreating some of the battles with the Spanish and such. So here's an actor playing Inti Raimi, who was one of the resistors of the Spanish uh, conquistador, and so they uh, have a parade for him in, in honor. Again, he's not allowed to touch the ground, and it, traditionally every bit of the body of the great leader would be kept, so that any hair cutting or fingernail cuttings would be put in the, his own personal temple. Uh, he just didn't have silver sea service that way. But anyway, the local people are... Uh, mostly Quechua. Aymara is the group that has a different language on the Bolivian, mostly on the Bolivian side. But again, these are very sturdy, capable people that uh, have been able to adapt to this high mountain altitude, including the children will have a pronounced um, um, amount of uh, hemoglobin in their blood so they can process in place with half the oxygen from its sea level. And our grandsons in New Mexico have the same thing. They leave, live at 7,000 feet. When they come down to sea level, there's no stopping them because they're so energetic. Similarly, they're fantastic runners come from the high mountains like that because of their hemoglobin content. Well, anyway, these are uh, surviving people. Again, up to 90% of them died in the colonial period, mainly due to smallpox, diphtheria, whooping cough, all the diseases that the Europeans carried over but were mostly uh, immune to. But even as a remnant population, they, they kept their language, their culture, and their music. If you ever heard the, the pan pipes of Condor Pasa and all that music that they, uh, you can see their bands playing in Europe and around North America even. And they're a pretty merry, fastidious bunch when the weather is and the season is right. So they da have dances and very colorful events. 
Um, and if you come back to Peru, it's worth going and staying for the time in Cusco or particularly some of the smaller towns that are not uh, so developed and you get a real feel for the indigenous uh, Quechuan culture. So they have, again, the agriculture in a very, host in a very hostile environment, but they developed uh, what's raised terrace farming. So they will build its stone walls and then they will use one plot that's uh, contained They'll put their compost and fertilizer, human fertilizer in, and what water there is they would bring there. So they were very productive uh, agriculture to this day in an area where you would not be able to do open field agriculture. But in the lower valleys, they'll grow grains in particular. This is canoa, which has been, been, been become a popular dish around the world now to the point where they can't keep up with the supply. But um, then they also have maize, corn, and other crops, potatoes especially. Uh, but the... Uh, Increasing drought is the real serious problem for all these areas. Uh, the snow cap is melting off. Some of the big glaciers are melting away and rivers are drying up. And so that's a crisis for the future of Peru as it is much of the world. So in, in the Andean countries of Chile up into Peru, they've developed a new system of harvesting cloud water with a kind of a netting that's put up on a pass where the clouds come at a certain time of day. And then the net is designed so it'll drip into a, a gutter and then it'll be collected and then become the water supply for a village. So they don't need to have carry it from afar. And uh, so life goes on in spite of these difficulties. Uh, here's something you might see in Peru. Uh, it's called a uh, chicha morada. And chicha is a kind of a beer that's made from corn. In this case, it's the, they roast the corn, or they have blue corn and pineapples and fruits, and then they, they, they heat it all up sort of like a mulled wine, and then they serve it like this. You could ask them if they have it at the bar. I bet they do. <laughs> it's sweet, though. It's sort of a cocktail, but a lot of flavor because of the fruit. Uh, then there are these are curandero, which is a herbal um, merchant. Uh, little um, merchant in one of the little towns, but you can see he has a boa constrictor as a shade uh, for his shop. That came from the Amazon. And then again, on the eastern side of the Andes, where it's lush with rain, they grow a lot of uh, coca leaves. So this is the tea of the Andes, which is used as a soup and as a chewing and as a um, flavoring. But of course, it got turned into cocaine by um, medical science or chemical science. So the, uh, particularly in Bolivia, they have legalized it so that everybody can have it, but they just ban the processing of it. But that's become the plague of the Andes because all of the illegal production and smuggling of it for the noses in the world. But uh, up in the highlands, you have wild llamas, and these are vicuña. These are very fine um, fur that are turned into shawls and things, sort of like a uh, pashima. And then they have cattle that the Spanish brought, so they have a rodeo tradition, but not too many horses up there. Um, the land is actually so steep that it's better for llamas to get up because the horses prefer level ground. Well, I'm going to take you down the valley toward the Amazon. This is Oyotambo on the Incan Highway from Cusco. That was about a f when we went there in 1971, we had to chop our way through, going past the ruins of other fortresses and villages. And this was where the rebel Incan army retreated and built the f the sky fortress, the the you know the lost city in the clouds of Machu Picchu. And that is a remarkable sight just because of the sighting of it up on a cliff, totally uh, a uh, escarpment to get up to it. It was in 1911 that the American um, archaeologist Hiram Bingham tried to follow stories about lost cities in the Amazon as you go down to the east, and he did find um, Machu Picchu. It was kind of overgrown and, and abandoned, and forgotten even by the locals, but uh, this is the, the, the view of it as you come over the mountain down to it, and you can just see it's sort of hanging cliffside um, uh, ruins, but you can get there now on the Urubamba River, which is a very fast running stream that goes down. It's not navigable, but what they did is they built a train down there, and now people go by train a certain amount of day. There's a funicular, you go up and you can visit the ruins. Um, previously, the, the, the whole mountain area like that had um, rope bridges, and this was, again, a fantastic technology where they would bind up fibers and then they would make a very large 
bridge where they could take many people plus their llamas and their goods through the mountains on this. When the Spanish first saw that they couldn't believe that they could actually be constructed or they would be safe because there was nothing uh, solid. Um, uh, there is one that is over 500 years old south of Machu Picchu that is still being used. They're so durable. But they don't make them anymore. They prefer concrete, uh, I guess, nowadays. But again, more of Machu Picchu, which is a remarkable place. Uh, you, can, you can see a lot of fantastic pictures of it, but going there is pretty mysterious, uh, even if you have other people with you. When I went there, there was nobody there f first. And uh, a lot of it has been, again, cleared and excavated, so they've found all the more terraces. They put up some of the thatched roof. They still don't let anybody stay in the ruins. There's a little hotel down on the by the river in the train station. But this aerial view just shows how big a town it was, thousands of people, plus their agriculture, but at a p place where nobody would ever build a city except that they didn't want to submit to the Spanish rule. So this is uh, a sight to be seen if you can get back there. And I hear that they did open up the airport in Cusco, so people are going back there now. But it often has a waiting list, so they only can take so many people there. And this is one of the, the great wonders of the ancient world. Um, and up on the very top of it, there's a temple to the sun, it's called, though they don't really know the, any of, the, there's no documentation of what this was, but this is a, a walkway and up to the very peak rock of it. And you notice all the, how they carve steps right in the stone and build up the boulders. <coughs> and you go up a passageway up into the final temple. And then there's this stone, which may have been, uh, a devotional stone or sacrificial stone, nobody knows, but that's the very tip of the temple in Machu Picchu. So I'm going gonna, gonna to read you a little bit of um, from the book of uh, the Heights of Machu Picchu of Pablo Neruda, who um, traveled there as a young man also, and uh, he, he wrote um, about the, the ghosts and the the spirits in the in the rocks and all, and uh, I'll, uh, it's actually much better in the Spanish. It starts out, uh, "Sube y nacer conmigo, hermano. Arise to birth with me, my brother. Give me your hand out of the depths sown by your sorrows. You will not return from those stone fortresses." You will not emerge from the subterranean time. Your rasping voice will not come back, nor your pierced eyes rise again. But I, uh, I come to speak for your dead. And if you ever have a chance to read the whole poem, it's a very dramatic and uh, powerful sort of Homeric uh, uh, homage to this particular site. Whoop, and there it went. Uh-huh, and it's back. Well, the other part I'm going to show you, I'm going to finish up to show you, the another part of Peru we won't get to, Lake Titicaca on the border with um, Bolivia. And this is the one of the world's largest fresh inland lakes, but it's so high, it's its base level is about 10,000 feet, so it makes it by far the biggest high altitude lake. And with villages bordering around it, wild vicuña, and uh, unusually they have these balsa wood boats that are all made out of uh, kind of a uh, a reed that grows lushly on the the wetlands. And so they they wove these boats and make them so light, like a kayak or canoe, you can carry a lot in them, but when you just pull them up on shore. And this is a technology, again, it's astounded the Europeans to find out that these people could build boats like this. In the Spanish time, they found the ones that were over 150 feet long doing coastal trading, trading at sea, made by the same reeds, and the craftsmen would come from Lake Titicaca to build ships for the ocean. Well, th on the shores of... of uh, Titicaca there, there's the, one of the major ancient temples, pre Inca again, called Tijuanco, Juanico, where they have towers and plazas and um, inscriptions, particularly to this god, the uh, Viracova, the, the god of creation. And Peru has seen so much upheaval, contrast, uh, cultures, uh, uh, injustice, now climate change. So the future of it is very much what 
a lot of the trouble in the past was. So nowadays, perhaps someone's praying to Vera Kocha for some sort of relief from the troubles of Peru, which is its own wonderful place with some remarkable people. And above all, they're resilient. And this culture and this country will probably survive all, many more troubles, we hope, and we should uh, appreciate it while we can visit it. Anyway, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you on shore and around board the ship. Thank you. Yes.